Uh, 11 past 3 it's now gone up to 923 until it goes up to as we can see 1000 dislikes in the space of about an hour you can go on to an uh, internet sites by YouTube dislike the dislikes went up exactly an a thousand so we can see clearly this is the package that this person has and whether it was the Sunny Dower channel I don't know Alice says no eye has seen, no ear has heard, or human heart can ever think of. However, it is written, what no eye has seen, that no ear has heard, and no what, and what no human mind has conceived. Muhammad is taken from Paul rather than Isaiah, because Isaiah does not say anything about the heart, but Paul does. So their own prophet is taken from Paul. Hello Soko family, just want to say shout out to well, all the Soko family, Christians, non-Christians, even Muslims, you know, I hope you all enjoy the content and are edified by what we do, you know, and I do want to say shout out to all the commenters, I do read the comments and I do take on board kind of everything that's said. So basically today's talk, I'm just going to do a quick response video to Shamsi, he did a video uh, last night in response to the video I did last week about the prophethood and um, the claims about the Bible. I'm just going to quickly go through everything. I've kind of just cobbled together a few verses and stuff um, to kind of respond to. But there's also uh, something I wanted to bring up. Well, I think in this park we've seen some very devilish behaviour. A lot of the time Christians get slack from Muslims for being disingenuous or uh, ha doing very deceptive tactics and what happened last week the video was put up and it was taken down now what was very strange with this is that I woke up to this message as we can see Paperboy message to Shamsi is no longer available due to a copyright claim by Sunny Dower now this was a bit strange i thought okay that's a bit extra you know sometimes you know as christians we know where when the truth is out there people want to suppress the truth they want to hide what's what's out there you know and from if we go to the sunny dower channel we can see a message from soko asking why they flagged uh, the video and they basically said, did you ask my permission? He, Soka asked, can I use it? And they said, no, you can't. I mean, it's very petty. You know, it was just uh, very, what, one, two seconds. But for those two seconds, they had to take down the video. Now we have to ask, is it really about the copyright or was it about a deeper context of what was in that video? And now I'm gonna kind of highlight something very devious and something no Christian missionary or whatever the Islamic Dawah team want to call them channel has ever done and I've never ever seen this so I was just uh, looking at the comments on I think it was it was the, on the on the 15th whatever day that was and there was about 180 likes for the video people were like liking the video saying positive things and there was about 20 dislikes so then in that same day, about an hour later on, I went onto the same video and this is what I saw. 180, 89 likes, 372 dislikes. I thought that's a bit strange because in a very short space of time, 372 people have disliked the video. Something very strange. So I went on again, n another five minutes later, it had gone up to, as we can see, 517 and you know very very strange so I, I thought okay let me keep watching and keep refreshing the page and see what happens so then again uh, about another five minutes later it's gone up to 100 582 dislikes the dislikes were going 
are at an unprecedented level I've never seen before. And then again, it's up to 614. And I thought, okay, let me just document this a bit more. So I've obviously now taken a timestamp. I've taken a screenshot of the time. So you can see at 2.45 or 2.43, it's now gone up to 734. At 4, uh, 2.55, it's gone up to 812. At uh, 11 past three, it's now gone up to 923 until it goes up to, as we can see, 1000 dislikes in the space of about an hour and this is something I've never ever seen before and I even you know I, I even messaged JC and was like look what's, what's what's happening on your video look at these devils these this the tactics of Satan you know that they don't want this video up that they're disliking it because sometimes when you dislike a video so much um, the algorithm of YouTube can re like remove the video thinking it's there's something ne negative about it but the only thing of negative about this video was that we were exposing the truth about Islam. So now, what people don't realize is that you can go on to an, uh, internet sites by YouTube dislikes. So look, here we see $5, 100 dislikes. You can have silver package, 250 dislikes. Or you can have the gold package, $25, 1,000 dislikes. So interestingly, within that hour or two, the dislikes went up exactly an, a thousand so we can see clearly this is the package that this person has and whether it was the Sunny Dower channel I don't know it's a very coincidental that uh, you know that it went up so quickly the day before they got the video taken down I'm not making any accusations but you know if something s seems fishy then it probably is fishy there's no smoke without fire and clearly, as we can see as well, just the next day, um, I think YouTube's uh, algorithm must have picked up because the dislikes have gone from a thousand back to, down to 136. So obviously, they may their their um, systems must have realised that you know someone's trying to basically hack the the channel and put so many fake dislikes on it. You know, and again, so then the next day we see a copyright claim. Now I ask in a logical. Re for everyone to think logically that we've seen the video was taken down by a very silly like flam uh, kind of very pedantic point of a copyright claim two seconds of video footage and then the day before we see someone has literally gone to their account paid hard-earned cash to dislike the video with a thousand dislikes and try and get it taken down so I'm just saying I've never seen this from any Christian channel or anything I've never seen it I was flabbergasted that this is the extent that they go to whoever it is to kind of suppress the truth you know but you lot can decide for yourself who you think it was but for me I think coincidences don't exist you know it's too coincidental that the video has been up for a few days then all of a sudden a massive inrush of dislikes you know maybe they uh, you know, play this video in Saudi Arabia in the cinema or something and everyone got in their phone and was like, dislike, 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 but I doubt it. So, you know, it speaks for itself. And, you know, I just want to highlight people that the tactics of certain people out there, I'm not making any claims, but I'm just putting it out there. When people dislike the truth, they try to suppress it. So now I just want to go on to talk about the response to uh, Shamsi and his video he made in response to my video last week so first of all he was talking about the origin of the Torah and saying that I said that it was Ezra what well, I said it was a scribe so initially in the video I said it was a scribe and if we look in the Bible uh, many prophets had scribes so as we can see here Jeremiah 36 4 it says so Jeremiah called Baruch son of Neriah and whilst Jeremiah dictated all the words to the Lord had spoken to him Burak wrote them on the scroll so when I was talking about scribes you know my you know probably sometimes what we 
tend to do, we kind of think people have the same think, thinking and understanding as us. Clearly not. This is what Muslims try to jump on. So my understanding is, yes, that prophets can have scribes as well. So when I was saying it could have been, it was a scribe, it was under the authority of a prophet, not just a random person who just added something in. So in terms of the who added, who wrote this Torah, it says, for centuries, both Judaism and Christianity accepted without question the biblical tradition that Moses wrote the Pentuach. Pentuach. Uh, ben Sira, who was actually who lived in the second century BC, Philo, who lived before Christ, and the Talmud, uh, and the Mishnah, are unanimous in the acceptance of the Mosaic authorship. Then it says the only debate centered on the account of Moses's death in Deuteronomy uh, 34. Philo and Josephus affirm that Moses described his own death, while the Talmud credits Joshua with the eight verses of the Torah, presumably the last eight. Now Shamsi said, well, how can this be uh, for Moses? Now the question is, does God see the past, present and future? Yes, he does. So there are traditions, as we can see, it says here, Philo and Josephus, Said that Moses wrote his about his own death and there's no reason to if people want to say um, G Moses wrote his about his own death that God wanted him to see how he would die and be remembered everyone you're well, well within your right to claim that so he says well I I say it was someone else yes I'm trying to be intellectually honest and say in my opinion from the information that I look at I think it was Ezra there's nothing wrong with that I can say well it was God and they cannot disprove that just because something's written in the third person it doesn't mean that God uh, didn't reveal this to Moses because there's traditions in from the uh, Talmud and Mishnah where it says Moses was crying as he wrote those words that how he would be remembered and God was trying to show it to him so I don't understand how Shamsi can adamantly claim or oh, this isn't from God I think it was Ezra <laughs> Ezra was what was a scribe and this is consistent with what I said before and he was also one of the uh, greatest men of God so he was well within his right to be divinely inspired to uh, conclude the narrative of uh, the, the Torah just as so people remember and it's the a befitting eulogy about Moses now Shamsi again we're gonna I'm gonna go back to uh, he spoke about the corruption of the Bible in Jeremiah but this is one of them another deceptive tactic of the Islamic Dao team they say Jeremiah 8, 8 says the lying pen of the scribes but hold on let's go to Jeremiah 26 what does it say it says early in the reign of Jehokim son of Josiah king of Judah this word came from the Lord this is what the Lord says stand in the, the courtyard of the Lord's house and speak to all the people of the towns of Judah who come to worship in the house of the Lord. Tell them everything I commanded you not, and do not omit a word. Perhaps they will listen and each will turn from their evil ways. Then I will relent and uh, not inflict on them the disaster I was planning because of the evil they have done. Say unto them, this is what the Lord says. If you do not listen to me and follow my law, which I have set before you, and if you do not listen to the words of my servants, the prophets, whom I have sent uh, to you again and again. So what it's saying is Jeremiah is instructing these people to follow the law. But if the law was corrupted, how could he follow the law? This is why you have to read the Bible in context. When they say 8-8, Jeremiah 26, 1 to 5 refutes that claim. And even let's go to the book of uh, Malachi. Malachi 4 and Malachi was written after Jeremiah it says remember ye the law of Moses my servant which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all Israel with their statutes and judgments now good God could not say that to the people if they did not have the Torah with them if it was corrupted in Jeremiah 8:8, 8, 8, then what is God saying to them to follow the laws because this is what the Islamic Dawah team like to do they pick and choose and they do not read in context and one final verse which will just refute that claim of Jeremiah 8, 8 we go to the book of Nehemiah now it says 
all the people came together as one in the square before the water gate they told Ezra and Ezra is the person who I said can and I you know who I believe was the scribe who added the ending of Deuteronomy it said they told Ezra the teacher of the law to bring out the book of the law of Moses what does it say uh, and obviously I've just gone for the NIV, um, NIV translation but if you go to the um, King James it says he was the scribe so it's saying the scribe brought out the book of Moses so if this book was corrupted how can this person the one of the greatest men of God bring it out for the people to uh, to observe so this refutes that claim so if anyone ever says to you Deuteronomy 8 8 is evidence of the corruption of the Torah just show them Jeremiah 26 1 uh, Malachi 4 4 or Nehemiah 8 1 which all come after Jeremiah 8 8 so this refutes that claim instantly also Shamsi he spoke about um, when I spoke about uh, Surah 3 3 about what was in between the hands he said I use Google Translate but actually hold on this is another fabrication this is how the facts are distorted let's see this is from if people can see I'll try and zoom in a little bit I did not actually use Google Translate I used I went to a website called uh, the, Car the, the Quranic Arabic Corpus maybe some of these Muslims will say it's a website designed by Christians or missionaries that's what they usually do but clearly it says welcome to the Quranic Arabic Corpus and a noted list linguistic resource which shows the Arabic grammar syntax morphology for each word of the Holy Quran so it gives you a word-for-word -word breakdown so, so this is why if we go down to uh, the word, the, the correct verse. Let's see. So we can see the word Baina, and this is the word that they translate as to before. So if I click on it, this isn't again, does this look like Google Translate? No. So this is again, we see the false <laughs> uh, accusations that I was using Google Translate when this is the same page we can see Baina. So it shows within the Quran, highlights it, and it shows between 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 every time the word is used and all the surahs so this is not google translate this is actual uh, arabic website uh, about the quran that, where you can get a word for word understanding of the word so clearly we see the word in between was um something that was literal now the funny thing about uh shamsi is that he can be uh you know his claim is that what Jesus had was before him but the Quran does not support this now if I go to for example uh, Surah 291 it says and when it is said to them believe in what Allah has revealed they say we believe in what was revealed to us and they disbelieve in what came after it while it is the truth confirming that which is with them they say why did you kill the prophets Allah before if you're believers? So what it's clearly saying is the, the believers had something literal with them. Allah is, if Allah is the truth, he's given them something to, as a guidance. And this was something physically they had. And what they had was not corrupted. Because this is also confirmed in Surah 447, where it says, Oh, you, have been, oh, you who have been given the scriptures, in brackets it says Jews and Christians believe in what we have revealed uh, to Muhammad confirming already what is with you before we efface before we efface faces uh, and turn them behindward or curse them so basically it's saying again that the the Christians and Jews had something literal with them this is what the guidance Allah had for them as a guidance so for anyone who says that the Torah or the Bible is corrupted it's a straight up lie because this is not what the Quran is talking about and even at more evidence to expose how Shamdi deceives the truth or uh, obscures the truth is because he quotes Ibn Qasim Ibn Qasim was a uh, 10th century scholar or historian how is a 10th century person 
going to then, he was the first person who made the claim that the Bible was corrupted. But how does he know better than the people that lived in the seventh century? Because this is what Muslims do. They pick and choose their scholars. Now, the earliest scholars do not agree with Ibn Hazm because uh, Ibn Abbas, who was the cousin of Muhammad, he, Muhammad prayed to him that he would be the that, that foremost scholar of Islam and he had an uh, understanding of the Quran like no other. Now, if we go to... Actually, I should have uh, this verse. So, if we, this is the... Um, this is in the dictionary of is Islam. So I, because I rather than go to the source, I'll just give you a summary of what uh, has been said, and we can see how, for Muslims, they pick and choose their scholars to fit a narrative that obscures the truth of what the Quran is saying. So they're actually corrupting what the Quran is saying. So if I see, so basically. In terms of, there's a verse where it talks about uh, Jews uh, um, changing the words of the scripture. This is referred to as tarif. So you have two types. Tarif uh, al-lafzi, which is corruption of the text. And you have um, tarif al-manawi, uh, which is corruption of the meaning. So you have two different types of tarif. So what, um, when we see the corruption of the Sahih International version, when it says it confirms what was before, this is a corruption of the text because it's trying to say, and Muslims will try and claim that um, the Quran is talking about ta tarif al uh, tarif il lafiz, however you say, it. excuse my Arabic, but this is corruption of t the text. But this is not what it's talking about. So now let's see what it says. Because we can, you can go and check in the uh, primary sources and confirm this if you want to. But this just has a nice summary of the earlier scholar opinion. So it says, Imam uh, Muhammad al-Bukhari records that Ibn Abbas said, the word tarif, which is corruption, signifies a change to a thing from its original nature. And that there is no man who could corrupt a single word of what proceeded from, his, from God. So that the Jews could corrupt only by misrepresenting the meaning of the words of God. Not that they actually changed it. This is the, remember, this is the person that lived with Ma, at the time of Muhammad. So the co copy of the, uh, what the Jews and uh, Christians had, he would have witnessed it. So how is it the earliest scholar, the one who had the best understanding of the Quran, is not saying it was a corruption of the text? But then Ibn Qasim, in the 10th century, is making this claim. It's because as Muslims started to interact with Christians, they started to realize that actually, if we confirm this, we, we, we throw our religion in the bin. So then they had to say they were changing the meaning. Because remember, Ibn Abbas, the prime, one of the most foremost scholars, he said, no, it's changed, they twisted the meaning. And also it says, uh, Ibn Mazar and Ibn Hatim state that the commentary known as Tafsir that they have it on the authority that Ibn Muyyana, that the Taurat and the Injil are in the same state of purity in which they were sent down from heaven and that no alterations have been made in them but that the Jews were that wanted to deceive the people by sound arguments and by wrestling the sense of the scripture so obviously again they're confirming this uh, concept that what they had in their hands was was legitimate and that all the Jews did was corrupt the meaning of the text because also um, if we look at Al-Tabari uh, Al who was also before Ibn Qasim what did he say he said they alter its meaning that is they change its direction and meaning from one to another meaning not that they physically corrupted the text and this is why people have to be very careful of when the Islamic Dawah team, they pick and choose their scholars. And that's why when I said about Surah 3.3, 3, that Shamsi said, oh, it's before. Oh, you know, someone else, so and so said it was before. So if uh, people like, um, like Shamsi are, you know, they consider themselves the school of Sunnah al-Wal-Jamaah, 
you know, they, re they reflect themselves upon the first three generations, the Salafis. Why isn't he rejecting or he's thrown under the bus the opinion of uh, Ibn Abbas, who was one of the first three generations, one of the Sahabas, one of the people that his prophet prayed for. So what gives Ibn Qasim the authority to then change the context of what Ibn or what gives him, I would like him to respond, why does Ibn Qasim have better authority and understanding of the meaning of Taruf than Ibn Abbas? And we also see Tabari, who was before him, confirm the same thing. Now we can also look at um, Al-Razi, who was also a prominent scholar. What did he say? He said, it is impossible if the speech of God has been made manifest to a large number of people like the manifestation of Quran. So he's saying it's impossible to corrupt something if such a large number of people have it has been revealed to. So obviously from Mount Sinai, there was millions of Jews that saw the revelations. And what one of the funny things um, Shamsi says is that he pick up David and say, how can David do this and that? That this is an evidence of a corruption. But if you ask a Jew, they will say, oh Christian, D David was one of the greatest kings that ever lived in, under Israel. He had a heart for God, you know. So how is it you can write negative of him and no one noticed, that they just allowed it. And remember, they call him the greatest king. It's like me um, going to saying, writing a book and saying Queen Elizabeth I was an African woman. And then everyone believes it. How, is that possible? You understand? And no one challenged it, but they just said, okay, let's accept this writing about our greatest king and that we can write a negative. Because historically, in her story, we have something called the theory of embarrassment. You're not going to write something bad unless it actually happened. And these are the things that, um, you know, actually happen and they're writing an account. And what Shamsi would do is two things. So in terms of David, he will say, oh, but David was a prophet. Look at what he did. Actually, okay, David was technically a prophet, but let's start from the beginning. If we look in the book of Samuel, Samuel was told by God to choose a king. He did it, God did not tell Samuel, choose a prophet to succeed you. So what qualified David as a prophet is because he, um, he wrote the Psalms and you see a lot of prophecies about the Messiah. So if you're a prophet, you prophesize about something, you can technically be called a prophet. But he wasn't called to prophethood in terms of calling to a nation to repent and as we see it with other prophets. And what made him a great man of God is that he had a heart after God and that he was very repentant. So Chamsi talks about him killing, uh, sending someone's uh, husband to war so he'd get killed. But when Samuel approached him and he said, told him the story and he said, what should we do with this person? And he said, you know, we should punish this person. And he said, actually, this person is you. What did David do? He repented, he prayed, he fasted, he was repentant to God and God forgave him, you know. So David was, that's why a lot of Christians would say David was more of a king because that's what he was chosen as. But yes, he did prophesize. But this is what one of the taxes of the Islamic deity to kind of distort like what, how we see prophets in a sense, like who, those who are called to nations. In the video, he speaks about Elijah saying Elijah saw angels in a cave. How do we know Elijah saw these people? Well, actually, the story of Elijah refutes these claims. But let's see, if we go to 1 Kings 18, 22 to 24, it says, Then Elijah said to them, I am only one of the Lord's prophets left, but Baal has 450 prophets. Get two bulls for us. Let Baal's prophets choose one for themselves and let them cut it into pieces and put it on the wood but not set fire to it. I will prepare the other ball and put it on the wood, but I will not set fire to it. Then you call on the name of your God and I will call on the name of the Lord, which was Yahweh, the God who answers by fire, he is God. So then obviously in this story, Elijah destroys the argument from these false prophets because God came down and rained fire on what he had prepared. Whilst all these other false prophets were exposed and this is why I keep talking about the Adra dates and Muhammad being affected by them he was clearly making a false prophecy so then um, Shamsi kind of makes a lot of straw man arguments so we'll go to um, another point where he talks about um, prophets can do one thing but then if Muhammad did it then we'll say it's a bad thing 
but the thing is it's like in this world there's a, we have this conflict or a, this, a debate or whatever you want to call it about freedom fighters and terrorists you know they can be this they can do the same thing but one would be called a terrorist sometimes you can be called a freedom fighter but the reason why you'll be called a freedom fighter is because of your cause you know for example Nelson Mandela was called a terrorist at one point then he was called a freedom fighter so just because a prophet does something and you do it, it you cannot be in the same category because that prophet had the authority of God this is why when Muhammad did something even if it was the same he did not have the authority of God to do it. So it's like me waking up and going to sacrifice my son and saying, oh, but Abraham was going to uh, uh, sacrifice his son. Therefore, the Lord should uh, have pride in me. No, this is not what God requires of us. It's because God gave Abraham a direct order and to do something and he was going to do it. And this is what um, God this is what God saw him and saw in him and was pleasing so only something can be legitimized because if God is the ultimate truth only God can uh, give you the authority to do something so when Muhammad was doing it he was doing it from his own mind his own devices inspired whatever demonic spirits or Satan whoever knows but it was not under the authority of God so I just wanted to get that point out of the way so he also talks about um, uh, Ishmael being um, given a blessing and I'd just like to invite brother Hudson for a, a minute just to because you know clearly we see in Genesis it says um, Genesis 17 19 so God said uh, yes but your wife will bear you a son and you, you will call him Isaac I will establish my covenant with him yes. as an everlasting covenant for his descendants after him so now because Ishmael was given, um, Abraham, Isaac was given the covenant, yes, Ishmael absolutely. was given a blessing. Absolutely. I'll, what was your understanding of the difference between the two? It's interesting actually, I spoke about that a while ago and the difference is, I mean, got, it makes it quite clear there that, um, I want to say this first actually because God made the position that he's going to give to Ishmael very clear, yeah. that he's going to be get 12 sons. Yeah. So basically God's going to look after him, yeah. so that's not the issue. So you know, sometimes they, you know, we wouldn't get the knickers in the twist a bit. Yeah. So I, try, I always try to establish that God has looked after Ishmael, he's made that clear. Yeah. But you know, there's a kind of but there, kind of clause. But he says, but, however, my, 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 my the seed is going to come through Isaac, yeah. through which Christ came. So he's making a distinction. Yeah. We're going to look after everybody as God does. Yeah. going to sort yeah. you out, you'll sort it out, you know, in close, 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 yeah. but my covenant, mm. that's the word that he says, is with, um, with, is, is through the seed of Isaac, through, through which the Messiah came. So God chose specifically for specific person, purpose Isaac, yeah. through whom the Messiah received, which is the seed that will bring forth the Messiah. So, and in your opinion, does uh, a blessing confirm that a prophethood can come from this line, the line of Ishmael? Say that again. Does God saying Ishmael will be blessed confirm yeah. that a prophet can come from the line of Ishmael? No. He simply didn't say that. Yeah. That's the first thing. This is very important. Yeah. He didn't say. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, yeah. and, and, and again, because that's important, because God's clear. Yeah. I mean, that verse is very clear. Yeah. This is what I'm saying. So, yeah. therefore, if he didn't say that a prophet can come from Ishmael, it means it can't. Yeah. Because he said what was going to be the situation with Ishmael. Yeah. And prophet wasn't one of them. Yeah. So, no. Exactly. <laughs> and just to add to that, because what another claim, Muslims like to try and insinuate that it was Ishmael that should have been sacrificed and he should have got all the blessings from the firstborn. But then if he should have had the blessings of Isaac, mm. then the prophethood would have come from his line. Not all the prophets would have come from the line of Jacob. That's right. Because if he got um, his blessings, everything would have come through the line of Ishmael, but clearly we didn't. This is why you can't go through the line of Jacob and Israel and then come back to Ishmael yes. and say, oh yeah, the prophet would was them. That, the, that whole line of prophet would yeah. have come through yeah. the Ishmaelites. That's right. Not the and it'd other. be continuous. Exactly. Yes. So this is why it's a very a deceptive lie that they use to say oh yes he was promised the um the prophet and also it says his hand will be against his brother's hand they'll he'll be like a wild man a donkey of a man and this is clearly like even if you look in the middle east muslims are fighting each other about everything you know all the mm. time the caliphs are collapsing they're fighting infighting it's it's right you know this is the prophecy of christ coming to uh, the prophecies of the bible coming to fulfillment so also even if we go into the Quran 29 27 and we gave to him Isaac and Jacob a place in his descendants prophethood and scripture where does it say Ishmael <laughs> and we gave him his reward in this world indeed he in the way after so it even says in the Quran the prophethood was given to Isaac and Jacob wow. where there's no Ishmael in here <laughs> so where are Muslims getting this <laughs> there you go. Exactly. 
you so know. in other words that's confirmed in genesis 17. exactly <laughs> and actually know. he's getting it right here isn't it because exactly. the quran claims that he's confirming isn't it exactly this is one good this is one proper way of confirming something exactly. that, that's how you do it. that's how you do it and also just one other point i would like to say um, just about shamsi's um tactics because he will say to me um i pick and choose hadiths he'll say okay if you take something from this hadith then you have to affirm all the hadith but then this is the same person who will take something from the bible and reject everything else this is a double standard either if the bible is your criteria you accept all the bible or you reject it you can't say to you can't say paper boy if you read read the hadith you have to accept all the hadith because in this hadith we see the corruptions but then he will do the same thing and say okay uh, Muhammad was prophesied in De uh, Deuteronomy 1818. 18. I will challenge any Muslim to show me one hadith or one verse in the Quran where Muhammad says, I am the prophet in Deuteronomy 1818. 18. You know, notice how they will always say, Where did Jesus That's say right. I am God? Use the wrong criteria. That's right. The so wrong show criteria. me yes. in those words. Exactly. Exact yes. words. That's right. Because even in the Bible, we see Jesus opening right. the scrolls of Isaiah and he says, These are the very scriptures that testify about me. Yeah. He reads from the scripture. Show me where yes. Muhammad read from the scripture and said, "These are the what this is verse testifies about me." Because this exact is word criteria. That's exactly. You want exact word criteria. I want, uh, and this is another right. thing yeah. that the Dawa team do. They will say um, Muhammad is prophesied in Isaiah, Isaiah about the Kedar. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, um, Isaiah 11, I think it is. Yeah. Something like but that. But I yeah. will challenge again another Muslim to show me where Allah confirmed Isaiah to be a prophet. So how can they, because this is the thing, if Allah has not confirmed this person as a prophet, yeah. they cannot claim this is a prophet, prophecy about Muhammad. Yeah. Because this, let's just for argument's sake, say Isaiah was writing about his uncle. Mm. This could have been a corruption that they keep yes, claiming that's right. in the Bible. So why at this point isn't it a corruption? Exactly, yes. but they will choose this. And even the Quran does not confirm Isaiah as a prophet nor do the hadith so i want to see where muhammad said isaiah is a prophet actually it's only allah who can confirm prophets so where muslims are getting these they will say this is muhammad they they actually a muslim can neither confirm or deny it because they can only confirm technically yeah. what allah has confirmed anything allah hasn't confirmed right, they yeah. cannot make a claim on it so i want to see again where does muhammad say this bible verse refers to refers to me because it seems like the Muslims now are smarter than Muhammad that they can point to the verses that he was in but he himself couldn't put, point to these <laughs> own verses does that make sense? yeah that's right because this is yeah. what we see the gradual snowballing of mm. corruption of mm. Islam that it has to make certain claims against the Bible you know they pick and choose certain scholars <laughs> to support yeah. their narrative because actually when we see the, the earlier mm. traditions of Islam it doesn't support what the later people do but yeah. they realize that actually hold on if we affirm what's in this book it refutes our whole religion yeah. so then you start seeing a greater distortion shamsi said um muhammad visited jerusalem i would like to see the claim in the quran where it says that it doesn't say that in the quran it just says he he visited the furthest mosque we, it's something later that uh came in hadith and whatnot but it doesn't say in the quran allah did not say that he visited the furthest mosque so show me where this took place in the Quran. So now, also, um, Shamsi said that um, uh, Muslims they, conf they they bless Abraham, so they confirm Abraham. But in Numbers 29, it says, and it's talking about Israel. It says, "He who he bows down, he lies down as a lion, and as a lion, who shall rouse him? Blessed is he who blesses you." and curse is he who curses you. But Muhammad used to curse the Jews all the time. So clearly, Islam, you know, some Muslims, even in their daily prayers, they curse the Christians and the Jews. So, exactly, so how, according to this, are you saying that yes, we affirm Abraham, we bless, you know, who, who blesses Abraham, when it's clearly talking about Israel, and that's the children of Israel, that, you know Muslims curse these people so obviously this is saying you will be under God's curse he spoke about Jesus being crucified um, and that's and taken a, a curse upon himself and this is a very important thing uh, in terms of Christian theology so 
what some people misconstrue sometimes they f think that being on the uh, cross itself being on a hung from a tree is what cursed the person it's not what cursed the person it was the breaking of the covenant that cursed the person so if we go to Deuteronomy 21, 22, 23, it says, if somebody guilty of a capital offense is put to death and their body is exposed on a pole, you see, they're put to death first, they were stoned generally for that cut, uh, capital offense. That's, this is what would have cut them off from God. That would have put them under a curse. So it says, you must not leave the body hanging on the pole overnight. Be sure to bury it the same day because anyone who's hung on a pole is under God's curse. You must not desecrate the land, uh, the land the Lord your God is giving to you as an inheritance. So it's obviously saying it was their actions that led to that curse, not just being on the, the, the pole itself. So this is what they will try and say, oh, Jesus was a curse, blah, blah, blah. But let's clarify what the scripture talks about, because when they say Jesus, Jesus becoming a curse is what unites, you, uh, unites the whole Bible, ties it all together. So let's see, we go to um, the book of Leviticus, Leviticus 1, 1 to 7 about the burnt offering and everyone knows that Jews used to have the temple to sacrifice and stuff like that. So we have to understand why was the sacrificial system needed? So if we go to Leviticus 1 it says, now the Lord called to Moses and spoke to him from the tab tabernacle of meeting saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, when, are any of you, when any one of you brings an offering to the Lord, you shall bring your offering of the livestock and the herd and of the flock. It says, if his offering is a burnt sacrifice of the herd, let him offer a male without blemish. And this is a very important thing because God only ac accepted ac sacrifices without blemish. This is why Jesus was also without sin, a perfect sacrifice. So let's carry on. It says, he shall offer it of his own free will at the door of the tabernacle of meeting before the Lord. Then he shall put his hand on the head of the burnt offering and it will be accepted on his behalf to make atonement for him. He shall kill the bull before the Lord and the priest. Aaron's son shall bring the blood and sprinkle the blood around the altar that is by the door of the tabernacle of meeting. And then it says, he shall skin the burnt offering and cut it to pieces. So. Clearly, we see the very early theology of the reason for sacrificial, the sacrificial system. God obviously always wanted a blood sacrifice um, and this was to atone for sins. So this is the beginning. So we go, if we go on to, again in Leviticus 16.16, 16, it says, So he shall make atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanliness of the children of Israel and because of their transgressions for all their sins and so he shall do so so, so he shall do for the tabernacle of meeting which remains amongst them in the midst of their uncleanliness so clearly again we see the development that uh, the atonement will be for all of Israel you know we have this concept of sins being forgiven through a sacrifice and now we go on again on to, to Leviticus 16 21 22 it says Aaron shall lay both his hands on the head of the li life of the goat, confess over it all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgressions concerning all their sins, putting them on the head of the goat and shall send it away into the wilderness by the hand of the suitable man. So this is what we, where we get the concept of the scapegoat. The blame is put on this thing. So when Shamsi talks about, oh, Jesus was cursed, the devil's cursed, they're one of the same thing, no. Clearly we can see from this, you, you have an unblemished sacrifice and the sins was put on it, right? So then, you know, because maybe a lot of Christians sometimes if they don't understand the Old Testament, it, you know, they may not understand the whole theological con concept of why there was a sacrificial system and where, why Jesus died for everyone's sins and why this was the mes method of um, atonement. So also we go on to... Um, just a quick one in the book of Malachi it says um, this is after the gathering of Israel and they weren't adhering to the laws of uh, Moses properly so it says as, as a, a son honors his father and a son and a slave his master if I am a father where is the honor due to me if I am a master where is the respect due to me says the Lord Almighty 
it is you priests who show me show contempt for my name but you ask how have we shown contempt for your name and the Lord replies by offering defiled food on my altar but you ask how have we defiled you they're offering blemished animals for sacrifice and God is not happy with them because his requirement has always been a perfect sacrifice an unblemished sacrifice so then obviously if we go now into um, the book of John John 1 29 it says the next day John saw Jesus coming towards him and said look the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world this just confirms and concludes everything I've just spoken about about the sacrificial system but this is why Jesus became a perfect sacrifice he took upon him the sins of humanity and because I think um, Shamsi also spoke about Paul so this is what he says in Galatians Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law having become a curse for us that the blessing of Abraham might come, come upon the Gentiles of Christ in Jesus Christ that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith so this is not Jesus was cursed like because he did something wrong as this as we see with the lamb he took upon himself the sins and this is why what Paul is referring to that he became a curse he took upon the curse in the same way the scapegoat took the curse so when Shamsi says oh the Satan was cursed Jesus is cursed they're the same this is like a false doctrine and this is smashed by John and when we look at the whole uh, Bible in its context you know everyone even Muslims know that Jews sacrificed then we have to ask why did the Jews sacrifice why is it the Jews want the third temple what are they going to do with the third temple they, they want to restore the sacrificial system so unless you understand that theology you will never fully understand the concept of Christ and this is why Christ came in the flesh to be a perfect sacrifice this is why even in the Quran Jesus was the only prophet without sin but um, ask a Muslim why was Jesus without sin they don't know there's no theological reason behind it so um, just Hudson like in terms of that what do you kind of think about this whole theology and the Christ being a sacrifice and Muslims no, that, and I think that was very important the way you put it actually because you've got to make the connection between the Old Testament and the New Testament I do want to pick up on the point that you said though about um, Christ not being a curse or taking a curse it's massive difference mm. you know it's like it's like if you it could be to debt you know it's like if you paid my debt um, let's say I whatever you know I had a, some kind of conviction driving license conviction or whatever speeding too fast or I stole something and you came and either paid my bail you know, for example you know to get me out of jail or you or you paid the fine that the court levied on me mm. you don't now become the criminal mm. you know I was the criminal or committed the offense and you sorted it out quite simply you know and that's what crisis you know you don't now point to um, you and say oh you're a criminal you did oh it was you after all no it'd be silly because you, you're sorting me out no you know you stepped in and you bridged the gap so I'm saying you could have it's common sense really isn't it you know like what happened today yeah. you know you often hear people give these examples of um, what one would do for their parent or if one would do for their parent many times you get these analogies about God being a judge yeah so you know you may get these analogies many times yeah. you know you have Christ in the position of a judge yeah. and, and people give this scenario just imagine that while the judge was sitting there and he's doing the job that he does yeah and the next person up in his case was his son or his daughter or his wife mm. you know and if it was possible you'd say you know what i'm going to take your problem to you. rather than send you to jail like i usually do right fling him in jail i'm going to step down you know because, because god was a judge you know yeah. so that they use that image and it's a very good image yeah because you know god was a judge jesus was eternal yeah. and he took that position yeah. he said right i'm going to make the sacrifice as he said in hebrews mm. you know what i mean so I'm, I'm confirming what you said yeah you know so he wasn't so it's, it's quite clear and 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 only well actually the problem is you know as you said the quran uses certain words and i said this repeatedly it uses so it uses the same biblical word in certain biblical terms it doesn't explain them it doesn't know what they mean yeah. why that is we don't know so therefore when you put it on with them they can't explain yeah. because they cannot make sense because their whole theology about Jesus doesn't make sense when they then say that Jesus was the only one without sin yeah. they can't fill that gap yeah. and the reason why they can't fill that gap is because they're denying the scripture yeah. you know what I mean yeah. so the gap can't be filled so I'm, yeah. so I'm quite simply saying yes yeah. the difference in between Christ becoming a curse and being a curse he wasn't a curse yeah. he's not cursed he took our curse yeah exactly yeah. and this thing so, and some some Muslims will try a dawah team they will try and say Jesus had a sin but there's none listed and even in the hadith it confirms it um, and also so I just want to quickly go on as well um, but there's a verse because Shim, Shamsi spoke about the attribute of mercy of Allah and the, the, this is the hadith that he was responding to Allah said if you were not to commit sin 
Allah would have swept you out of existence and would have replaced you by another people who have committed sin and then asked for forgiveness from Allah. He would have then granted them pardon. Now, Hazan, what kind of strikes you about this verse? <laughs> <laughs> Read that again. <laughs> okay, it says, if you were not to commit sin, yeah. Allah would have swept you out of existence and would have replaced you by another people who have committed sin and then asked forgiveness from Allah. He would have then granted them pardon. Wow. <laughs> wow, it kind of sounds like, well, first of all, there's a confusion about sort of what sin is, mm. really, there by what I'm getting. But I have to be honest and sort of say, Allah sounds very confused mm. about how the, the, the definition of sin and, the of sin and what sin is. Yeah. And the reason for that, I'm understanding, is because the, the, the Muslim position is that, you know, basically they're not the original sin problem. Mm. And that's what it is. So it seems they're like Allah's going to, I don't know, it seems like Allah is confused. Yeah. That, that's the conclusion I work on. Because, in, yeah, yeah, from, because the, from your knowledge of the Bible, yeah. if does God want us to sin or no. would, would, God, would God prefer us to be sinless? Absolutely and that was his original intention. Yes. Exactly because Shamsi made a very big claim he took <coughs> individual response he said that God gave uh, Adam and Eve sin which I will address but I just want to address something about this mm. verse the problem with it is because one of Allah's um, attributes is that he is um, self-sufficient mm. and he's all merciful mm. and Bob had a debate with this um, a few a few months ago mm. Um, with uh, Hashim and stuff saying that Allah can't be self-sufficient and have an attribute of mercy because he has to then um, show this mercy. He can't say yes. it's an independent yes. attribute but then not show it because yes. he has to then, yes, his mercy is dependent because mercy is an action. And Shamsi, what Shamsi said, I will get his words correctly, he said Allah created his creation and one of the purposes is to demonstrate his mercy. And he also said he made creation in line with his attribute, but that attribute is mercy. So therefore, to display his mercy, people have to be sinners. So it seems like Allah's acted up towards sinning. Yeah, for exactly. Example, in order so that he can show that mercy. Exactly. That's what it's certainly now, implying, isn't it? Exactly. Yeah. This is very strange because even if we go to the Bible, we go to Timothy 1.9, it says, we know that the law is made not for the righteous, but for the lawbreakers, rebels, ungodly and sinful, the unholy and irreligious and those who kill their fathers or mothers and for murderers. So what he's trying to say, God wants you to be the righteous, mm. sin free, mm. but the law is used to expose your sin, yeah. that it's like a, a bar. So yeah. you can be like, you're transgressing the law, mm. but God always wanted us not to transgress, yes. Yes. you know, whereas Allah, to demonstrate his mercy, you have to sin, wow. you know, and this is a very, a uh, very dangerous theology because he said God created us with sin but the Bible doesn't say that yeah. if we go to Genesis 2 15 it says uh, the Lord God took man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of him and if we go to Genesis 3 5 to 7 it says for God knows when you eat from it your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God knowing good from evil and when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and was desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then, they, then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked and they sewed fig leaves. So where does this say God gave them sin? God told them not to eat from the tree and they went and ate from the tree and that is what then caused the fall of man. You know, this is not, Totally different from what this this hadith was saying, where God was say Allah was saying, you know, to demonstrate His mercy, you have to give sin. But then, obviously, if that's one of His attributes, He has to demonstrate His attributes to His people. Therefore, you are. We let's different arguments say. Let's say you're not required to sin, but you have to sin for Him to show His mercy. But God is a God of love. He wants you to be righteous, so He doesn't need to show His mercy if you're on the path path of righteousness already. And even this downfall is what led to one of the very first prophecies in the Bible. Like Muslims keep saying all the prophets uh, keep speaking about Tawheed, uh, you know, worship one God, one worship, one God, one God. But actually, if we go to Genesis 3.15, it says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between you, your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. This is a prophecy about the Messiah. Yeah. This is what the whole Bible is about the coming of the Messiah. This is what all the prophecies, over 300 prophecies about the Messiah. It's not just about Tawheed, one God, it's about the fallen state of man and the Messiah coming. 
This is why even the Jews are still waiting for the, the Messiah because they understand the importance of him. Ask for a Muslim who is the Messiah, they'll just say he's just an ordinary prophet, yeah, yeah. this and that. There's no significance of him. And this, this is again how you, you know, the Bible refutes these claims of uh, what the Muslims are saying. Also, he goes on to about the Iota, in that where Muhammad was um, killed, poisoned by the Ayatollah. Mm. So Muhammad said, well, Allah said that, Allah said the Watin, and then Muhammad, he said the uh, Abha, which is a different part. But actually, let's, let's look at this diagram. This is the anatomy of the Iota. So let's just for argument's sake say what Allah said is if a false prophet comes, he'll be cut off from the ayat of the heart. But Allah is saying, uh, Muhammad will say it's from the back or wherever. But oh, the look, the ayota is all of this. So this is why the translators translate the two words as ayota, or they say the life artery. Because it's like me saying, okay, if I'm going to do wrong, may God break my leg. And then if I break my shin, you saying, well, I broke my shin. Right. My shin's not my leg. My leg's <laughs> different from my shin. They're the same thing, brother. Mm. You understand? Yeah, it's, it's a part of your leg. But this is the semantics that they use. Yeah. They will say, oh, but this part is this part. But as we can see, this is your iota. This yeah. is what, and this is why, like in the translations, wow. all, and they, they're not translations from Christians. They're Muslim translators, linguists. They translate the word as the iota being uh, watin and the uh, abha as the iota. Clearly, we can see that this is the whole, whole iota. Shamsi said, well, no, this applies to only true prophets, that if the true prophet speaks wrongly in Allah's name, right. Allah will cut him off from the iota. Right. But this is a, a uh, you know, because basically, you know, pre in the previous video, I showed them the verse of I's, uh, Jeremiah, mm. where the prophets spoke, said, uh, no sword of famine will come into this land, but they were destroyed by the famine and the sword mm. to show them that these are false prophets. So Shamsi obviously spoke about the the poisoning and he said that Muhammad died in a peaceful way. But if we go to the hadith again, Aisha said, I never saw anyone suffer more pain than the messenger of Allah. This was in his illness. This is, so his death was not peaceful, you know. And one thing I want to address is Muslims keep saying, how can someone die three years after um, they were poisoned. First of all, Shamsi makes a, a big straw man argument. He said, the woman said you must die directly, straight away. She didn't say that. She said, if this poison, if you were not a true prophet, this poison will kill you. Now, let me ask you this. If I poison someone and they're in a coma for two years and then they die, are the police going to charge me with manslaughter or murder? It doesn't matter how long it takes to kill you. If that was the cause, it can take 10 years. They will still charge you with murder. So this argument from Muslims, oh, the, the, it, how can this, uh, the poison be in his system for so long? But if Allah cured him, then why did he go cupping? Because he went cupping multiple times. And clearly we see in the hadith that it says that he went to cupping because that was the direct um, cupping was the quickest way to um, alleviate the poison from the blood. So either Allah cured him or he didn't. And then Shamsi said, well, we saw a miracle in the hadith that the goat spoke after he ate. Why would this goat speak after he ate? Why didn't the goat speak before he ate? That's a miracle. You know, people might talk about Christ saying, because uh, he mentioned Jesus, God say, um, Jesus saying, praying to the Father, but the but the, his death, yes, he, he was in ang anguish in his humanity, but this was prophesied in the Old Testament. He knew what was going to happen, but it doesn't mean that he did not suffer as a human would, suffer anguish and anxiety as a human would. This just shows his for humanity that it was a big burden that he took upon himself, but he died for all our sins. He took this burden upon himself, you know. So when people kind of say, oh, uh, you know, how can Jesus do this and do that? But Jesus was, his death was exactly prophesied in the Old Testament. So this had to come to pass. Whereas with Muhammad, what we see is we see uh, excuses after the fact. Oh, the, uh, the, the lamb started speaking after he ate it. Well, he said one of the Sahaba died. Uh, well, from 
but then some of the other Sahaba ate um, the, the lamb as well, they didn't die. And some say, well, because he, he put it in his mouth, therefore the other Sahaba, he swallowed it and he died. But regardless of whichever um, opinion you want to take, it's still the same thing. Because I just want to show people this very quickly. It says, Russian dissident survived second poison attempt. I felt like I was su suffering. But hold on, <laughs> so did Muhammad. Let's see what he says. He says, um, he says, I knew straight away what was happening because this was the second time in two years that this happened and it began almost identically in the same way. So he says, uh, he says, Karim Mirza was rushed to hospital, Moscow barely maintaining consciousness long enough to call his wife uh, where she lived and he immediately called his doctor that he was poisoned and then he kind of goes on to say that there are still many consequences I feel like an 85 year old man when I walk but I still got to walk he said I'm really weak so clearly when people say oh poison has to kill you straight away it doesn't I find it very astonishing that how when Muslims talk about the Trinity for example they'll say it's not logical that God can be a uh, three personhood but then their logic goes out the window when it comes to natural things poison doesn't have to kill you straight away it can injure your internal organs and this is why the cupping corrobor corroborates the fact that uh, Muhammad was in internally affected by it and he's dis he progressively got worse until he knew he was going to die because Shamsi said oh he was cured from the poisoning if he was cured how did it come back and kill him it's either cured or it's not cured if it's cured you don't need to go to poison it for cupping and if you go for cupping that means it's not cured so clearly what we see is that he used to pray he used to pray he used to pray to um, have the illness taken away then at a point probably he knew that his health was beyond a doubt he was not going to survive and therefore he stopped praying and saying I'm going to become a martyr because it's funny yet that when the, uh, the Jews plotted against Jesus Allah plotted against them and they saved Jesus causing Christianity allowing people like Paul to come but then when the Jew woman was plotting putting the poison in the stew Allah said nothing he did not save him he did not not do anything until after the fact this is not what true prophecy is about and because I stand on this claim that the woman she was going by what she knew in the Old Testament because Shamsi makes loads of straw man arguments that Moses died prophets died so many prophets but the point is it's not that they died it's the circumstances of their death and no prophet can die under the assumption of being a false prophet because then that tarnishes the name of God so when in Shamsi's response videos he talks about prophets dying this is a big straw man because this clearly is not what I said in the video before I said it is the circumstances of your death you have to be um, accused of being a false prophet and be killed because there's implicit and explicit way to identify a prophet and this is why for example if we look at the story of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego they were told to worship a false god and they said if our god is true he will protect us they were thrown in the fire and they were protected and then what did the people say we know your god is the true god but for Muhammad he did not do anything to show that he was uh, a true prophet Shamsi says well how do we know he didn't eat the Adra dates that day again why are you making excuses a prophet should not say something and not live by those words if a prophet tells the people that okay uh, this thing can protect you from poisoning and magic then he should be adhering it to it himself so I will ask Shamsi then show me one verse where someone poisoned uh, or gave magic to Muhammad and Muhammad was taking Adra days and it didn't affect him he can't do that because what we see in the Islamic, uh, uh, the Islamic tradition and especially of the Islamic Dawa team and a lot of the scholars they have to fabricate meanings to these verses of what happened actually because one of the things Shamsi says he talks about um, Jews corrupting the, the, the Bible and saying how can uh, David be a prophet if he did this and how can someone be a prophet for example Aaron if he did that 
But what we see in um, the Sunni narrative is that they whitewash the prophets. But this is a very um, disingenuous tactic from the Dao team. Why? Because when you see a Sunni speak to a Shia, they will say they reject the Hadith because the Hadith make Muhammad look bad. They will say, how can a prophet be poisoned? How can a magic affect a prophet? Because they even do more whitewashing. They're doing what Shamsi is doing about the Bible. But it's, you know, but then Shamsi will argue with the Shias, no, this is what happened. This is what happened to a true prophet. But their argument is, this is not befitting of a prophet. So notice firstly, one of Shamsi's tactics. First, he picks and chooses. Because he said to me, if I accept this hadith, then I accept the whole hadith. Because I've heard him talk to Shias about um, al hubayt he will say to them, what is your criteria? The, Quor the Quran or the Hadiths? You cannot pick and choose. But then when it comes to the Bible, he does the very same thing. This is what we call a double standard. You cannot pick and choose from the Bible. You either accept it as your criteria and you didn't, do not say Muhammad is in the Bible because this, the Bible is not your criteria. You cannot place subjective because if that's what you're telling me, you're doing the very same thing. He's trying to expose me for hypocrisy, but he's exposed himself for hypocrisy because he does this all the time. Everybody's seen it. Again, in Numbers 23, 23, we see there is no divination against Jacob, no evil omens against Israel. Now it will be said of Jacob and Israel. So God protects his prophet. This is why the Jewish woman knew this. She knew it from the start. So again, you know, Shamsi needs to kind of give a good reason why then was Muhammad not taking his dates? Why is a prophet doing something and not do, taking his own advice? This is what people want to know. Shamsi and a lot of Muslims, they throw Paul under the bus. They love to throw Paul under the bus and say, Paul came with another gospel, right? Now, this is what I'm gonna show every Christian, because the thing, the thing is, a lot of the early scholars in Islam, they actually acknowledge Paul you know as uh, one of the one of the apostles of uh, one of the disciples well not the, the disciple but one of the apostles or uh, one of the followers they had nothing bad to say so again what we see consistently with islamic tradition is that the later scholars then come with a theory to discredit this thing that would actually discredit islam and i want to show you guys something this is a hadith at sahih al-bukhari it says the prophet said Allah said I have prepared for my righteous slaves such excellent things as no eye has ever seen nor an ear has ever heard nor a human heart can ever think of now I'm going to read it one more time because I want you to pay attention it says the prophet said Allah said I have prepared for my righteous slaves as no eye has ever seen nor an ear has ever heard nor a human heart can ever think of now let's go to the book of Isaiah Isaiah 64 4 now Isaiah it says for since the beginning of the world men have not heard nor perceived by the ear neither have the eye have seen O God besides thee what have uh, have prepared for him that waiteth so if we see the distinction between the two verses this verse that I had if I said before is paraphrasing Isaiah 64 4 but the order of the words in Isaiah 64 4 are different because if I go back again just for everyone to understand it says Alice says no eye has seen no ear has heard or human heart can ever think of where in Isaiah it says uh, no ear and then it says no eye but hold on Let's go into the book of 1 Corinthians 2 9. It says, However, it is written, What no eye has seen, that no ear has heard, and no what and what no human mind has conceived. Because Paul added in the bit about the human heart. So why is it Muhammad is taken from Paul rather than Isaiah? Because Isaiah does not say anything about the heart but Paul does so their own prophet is taken from Paul and anyone who knows about textual criticism this would not be a coincidence this is impossible 
this would be taken anyone who has any logical like intellect will will know that Paul took from this this verse so let's ask Muslims why then if you like to throw Paul under the bus has your prophet quoted from Paul rather than I the book of Isaiah very strange because God was the one who said that so that that God would obviously be Allah but then Paul's taken from uh, Allah's taken from Paul um, or Muhammad's taken from Paul it doesn't make sense and this is why we can see the plagiarism of the Bible continually continually you know ask a Muslim to talk, talk tell you about prophets they'll go straight to the Bible Muhammad's in the Bible they like to pick and choose either the Bible is your criteria or it's not so I just like to conclude this as a response to what Shamsi wrote you know so I would like to Shamsi respond to why is it Muhammad was quoting from Paul or Allah was taken from Paul rather than Allah himself who was the one who was supposed to have inspired Isaiah two I've asked him to show me a verse that confirms that Isaiah is a prophet that you seem to say that this whole Kedar verse is about Muhammad because if you cannot this could be one of the corruptions that Muslims are talking about Isaiah could have been talking about his uncle who took a trip to Qadar you cannot confirm this is Muhammad you cannot say this is Muhammad because if it's not confirmed by Allah then you you cannot do it and I'll ask him again to confirm to me where Muhammad said he's in Deuteronomy 1818 because Muslims ask us where did Jesus say I am God so we are asking the exact same question and I'd also like to ask Shamsi what gives Ibn Qasim the authority to have a better understanding of the uh, uh, Taruf, Taruf than Ibn Abbas who was one of the first three generations he was one of the Sahaba why is it Muslims they go to the later scholars and throw under the bus the earlier scholars I do not understand it and I want to, Shamsi to un clarify what gives Ibn Qasim a greater understanding of the Quran than Ibn ha ha Abbas or the understanding of Tabari because he's a later scholar and it seems that the verses of the Quran support the fact that what they had was not corrupted and I will just um, say in conclusion to that very first point even Ibn Tamir who came after in the 13th century he said in the world there are true copies these remained until the time of the prophet then he said uh, there is nothing in the Quran to indicate they altered all the copies so even though he's taken some of the understanding that okay maybe some of the copies were uh, um, falsified because this is he's come later but he said during the time of the prophet they had uh, true copies but Shamsi will say they could only confirm what was before because everything was corrupted so who is now exposed as you know disingenuous because yes we see majority of the early scholars agree with my position not Shamsi he's cherry picked those who agree with him and I just want to go back to the original point when I said I believe Ezra was the one who wrote that uh, Deuteronomy 34 I did not say he did like affirmative as Shams did because I'm trying to be honest I said I believe I didn't say it was because I know the differences in opinions but I'm saying this is my opinion but Shamsi will assert that it was matter of fact but it wasn't because clearly when we see from what the scholars say it's a very different picture so I would just like to uh, conclude my response here this will probably be the final response I mean if Shamsi comes with something relevant or interesting or if I debate with him in the park then I'll conclude but I think this is game set and match concluded and also you know guys we've seen even from the beginning of the tactics of people buying dislikes for the video what's this all about you know that whoever's uh, on this Sunny Dower channel I'm not saying it was them but it just seemed a very bad coincidence that the next day the video was taken offline you know but the Bible says a lie will be uh, prevail for a moment but the truth shall be established forever and Jesus the truth the way and the life and uh, we all call everyone to Christ and thanks for watching